Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. And so we're tonight, or this afternoon, we're going to be talking about dinosaurs for a little bit. Uh, how dinosaurs fit with the Bible, okay? And uh, so if some of you, how many have heard Mary Jo and I speak before? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, which one of you wants to give the lecture today? <laughs> well, why not, right? Dinosaurs in the Bible. Mary Jo and I were speaking in Costa Rica. We had the Costa Rican girls they actually were translating all of our slides into Spanish and uh, changing them. <laughs> so we sometimes didn't even recognize the uh, slides. But we're, it was interesting. They came up with this particular title for my dinosaur lecture. And that title was Prehistoric Species and Humans. I was thinking about correcting it, but I thought this might be a good teaching point. What's prehistoric? Before history, right? Okay, what does the first verse in the Bible say? In the beginning, God created. Hold it. There's nothing prehistoric then. It's all history, isn't it? The whole book of Genesis, historical. And uh, so there's no such thing as prehistoric animals. And so what about that? Those dinosaurs, oh, we've been taught they're prehistoric, but no, they're probably fit with a biblical record as well. And way back when, I was actually teaching on a television program how the study of geology, fossils, and uh, proved, and especially dinosaurs, proved evolution. I can already teach it at that young age because that's all I had ever been taught. My dad was an evolutionist, okay, and a skeptic and anti-Christian, by the way. And uh, so that was my dad. And so all I heard was evolution all the way through school. That's, I never heard anything except for evolution through all my training, okay? And uh, so at that young age, I could already teach evolution because that's all I had ever been taught. And I remember teaching that the rock layers of the earth formed the pages of earth's history. Great start for a television program, right? <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. And uh, basically, I would have uh, seen a cartoon like this one right here and thought, hey, cute cartoon, but no basis in reality. After all, no way were there even anything even resembling a pre-human before dinosaurs, right? So, or at the same time. So, <laughs> it came as a surprise to me to find out there's evidence that maybe people and dinosaurs may have lived together, may have seen each other, may have even hunted them. Those mighty creatures, right? Hmm. Uh, what you're looking at is a drawing of an interesting fossil that was brought into Grand Junction, Colorado uh, when I was going to college, okay? I was already at Colorado State University, and somebody brought in a backbone of a dinosaur, but this one had an arrowhead stuck in it. Now, what do you do with that information? If you believe in evolution, it doesn't fit whatsoever. After all, you know, dinosaurs and people were separated by approximately 100 million years. Maybe 65 to be more exact, but give or take a few million, who cares? But anyhow, but that's a lot of time in between. So what did I do with this very important fossil when I heard about it? I ignored it. I said, no way, somebody must have glued that arrowhead into the backbone of the dinosaur, promptly forgot about it. All right, other people in the Grand Junction area actually saw it, said it's genuine, we have to deal with it, but that still didn't bother me. My mind was made up. 
There's no way I could accept that, period, okay? And so it wasn't until after I was a creationist I even wondered about that, and I went to look for that fossil at a rock shop that was on display, and they sold it, and I said, who'd you sell it to? He said, well, I don't keep track of everybody I sell something to. <laughs> yeah, that would dead end for me, okay? All right, but unfortunately, young people are getting strong doses of evolution starting in kindergarten or as soon as they start watching most television programs. They'll get indoctrinated into evolution very quickly. It wasn't uh, until my third year of teaching on the college level that my wife, Mary Jo, found that particular book for five cents in a second-hand bookstore. We were on such a tight budget, it was a good thing it wasn't 10 cents, okay? But uh, for five cents, this book changed our whole thinking. But it didn't happen overnight. I look at that book and I said, either Dr. Dwayne Gish is crazy, absolutely nuts, or he's got a good point. We better look into it, okay? And so we decided we have to do our own research. Now, I'm going to ask you right now, before we go any further, how is the sound level in here? Is it just about right? Everything's good. All right, I just wanted to make sure. All right, so we're going to be looking at some of this. Sometimes I like to lean on a podium. And <laughs> but anyhow, you know, that book, however, got to us thinking thinking. We said, how in the world do we explain the fossil record? I thought the fossils proved evolution. And this guy who studied an awful lot, telling me otherwise? Well, this whole idea, after I started studying it, I found out the stellar, I, this whole idea of stellar and biotic, that's stellar astronomy, biology, uh, are all about evolution, are all belief systems. They're belief systems. It's not actually science. And so I say they're belief systems posing as science. Now, evolution is the pillar of a worldview that's called naturalism. I'll be using that uh, several times in this conference. Naturalism basically means everything that you study and interpret must be interpreted through only natural processes. You cannot allow God a foot in the door here in science. That's naturalism. And they say everything must and will and even can be interpreted by naturalistic processes. And I think by the time we finish here this weekend, you're going to find out uh, not everything can be explained that way. Okay? There is a creator God who created everything, and he did it in a fairly short period of time, too. He didn't need those millions and millions of years. So when we look at uh, dinosaurs, one of the things I found out that uh, even when we look at a dinosaur bone, it is subject to the interpretation of whoever is doing the research. If the researcher has a naturalistic worldview, he has to interpret that particular evidence in favor of evolution. But if you believe in a supernatural, you can interpret it in terms of creation too, can't you? It turns out that dinosaur bones are just as hard as, as for a creationist as they are for evolutionists. Just as hard, okay? I want to mention a couple of different things here. Uh, I, just the biases going on here. First of all, let's look at a couple of words here. Evolutionary bias. It is possible that instead of being a true dinosaur, this one might have been a very close relative lying just outside the dinosaur group, according to the Natural History Museum. It's possible. All right? We see these type of words, possible, might have, perhaps, frequently. They're not scientific words at all, okay? And you'd also see the word might have. They don't know that for a fact, do they? This is a lot of questions going on here. Here's a museum exhibit in western Colorado, and it's talking about the definition of a fossil. Any evidence of life more than 7,000 years old. 
I wonder how the museum officials decided that 7,000 was the magic number. Unless it was deliberate, knowing that cre many creationists say the Earth is only 6,000 years old, right? So we'll just put it a little bit more than that so we cannot have a creationist who is an paleontologist, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Can't have that whatsoever. We're going to learn to ask the right questions in this particular one. Another museum exhibit right here. It says Dilophosaurus and other dinosaurs were well suited for desert life where water is scarce. Time out, hold it. Just because you find the bones of these creatures in a desert environment today, does that mean he lived in a desert environment? No, all right, not at all. You just can't tell that from that. Um, I like this other part, to conserve water, they didn't sweat. Oh, time out, how do they know that? All they have is a pile of bones, right? So you have a lot of conjecture being put in with these museum exhibits, and it makes it sound authoritative, doesn't it? All right? No, we've got to watch it. Here's another museum exhibit. This is talking about Tyrannosaurus rex. It says here, the food source for T. rex. T. rex's primary prey, or what he ate, were triceratops and the duckbill dinosaurs. Time out. How do you know that? <laughs> Good question, isn't it? How many T. rex skeletons have they found with a different type of dinosaur in its stomach contact or content? And if you say none, you're right. <laughs> All right, so that's not enough to basically determine what his primary uh, food was, okay? Well, look at those big claws. They will also tell you, how many have seen Jurassic Park? Or one of the others equals, okay? <laughs> They had a big uh, claw on a Utah raptor. It was a nice big claw, and they said, aha, this was used for ripping flesh. And then that became the star of Jurassic Park. And it's interesting because Utah raptor was only reconstructed from parts, parts of five bones, one of which was the claw. There's a lot more bones on an animal, right? Is that enough evidence to get that entire creature and make a movie about them? Not quite. Well, those are big claws, too. Wow, it's ripping flesh. Actually, no, it belongs to a blue jay. <laughs> okay, blue jays. And they don't have to fight with their food. Okay, not at all. Nuts and seeds, etc. Look at those big claws. Mm-hmm. They're really helpful for scratching an itch on the slot. Or perhaps um, hmm, hanging upside down from a limb where they can actually lock those things into place and go to sleep. Hanging from a limb of a tree. So that's what they use those big claws for. Now, I don't want you to get scared and have nightmares tonight, but look at these big claws and this ferocious creature here. <laughs> Yeah, he's called the original honey bear, okay? He uses those claws to fight his way into a honeycomb. Not too vicious, okay? Uh, look at the big tooth. Uh, we've been told that the big tooth means it's a carnivore. It eats meat, okay? Hmm. Do, do you realize grizzly bears have big teeth too? You know what its favorite food is? Pine nuts uses the claws for digging out uh, certain tubulars in the, and that's what they really want to eat toward the hibernation. A grizzly bear will also eat approximately 30, depending on where they are, if they're in the moth country, 30,000 moths per day. <laughs> Isn't that, you never knew that. How all the pine nuts. It's pretty slow for a poor old grizzly bear, right? He listens. Aha! Now he hears a chattering squirrel. So he moves in for the kill. Not the squirrel, but for the cache of pine nuts. And he just devours them. So you don't know. A good share, 
of what the grizzly bears eat happens to be vegetation. Okay? And so you never know that. Well, look at those big teeth there. It belongs to a fruit bat. Peels his favorite kind of fruit with that. Uh, another big tooth creature is another type of bat called a nectar bat. All right, nectar. He uses those teeth, by the way, to groom his uh, fur. This is the uh, spider monkey, great big teeth, but another fruit eater in general. Pandas love bamboo. Mm -hmm. And it may be a little rodent that happens to come by sometimes, but those teeth, the favorite prey happens to be bamboo for that guy. So may, maybe T-Rex loved watermelons. See, we weren't there. We didn't see it. We couldn't, we don't know. The only way to tell for sure what T-Rex prefers to eat is to invite him out to McDonald's restaurant. And let's find out if he orders the chef salad or the chef who made the salad. <laughs> the only way to tell. Okay, we are told that dinosaurs lived billions of years ago, correct? If I go into uh, most public schools, that's what they'll say. If I go into a Christian school, I'll have most of the kids say millions of years ago. I go to a homeschool conference, and I'll have most of the kids saying thousands of years ago. All right? And uh, so when did they live? Well, according to the uh, book of Genesis, we find out that God created man and the land animals on day six. All right, that could be a good biblical basis. Well, what kind of creature was a dinosaur? Land animal, most of them, okay? And so that would, might indicate that people may have been created on the same day. Mention that to a six-year-old, and they'll probably say, you're crazy, these are six-year-olds. Why? Because they've been taught evolution, starting from those young ages, okay? And so, uh, so that fits with the idea that somebody actually was hunting one of those, doesn't it? All right, they found fossilized, unfossilized dinosaur bone in Alaska, okay? Now they're finding soft tissue, red blood cells, even little strands, pieces of DNA in petrified dinosaur bone. Soft tissue. I remember when I was a kid, about 14, 15 years old, I was doing a lot of cutting and polishing, making jewelry out of petrified dinosaur bone. In western Colorado, where we lived, there was a lot of that to be found. And um, I remember many times grinding on my piece of dinosaur bone, and all of a sudden I get this rotten egg smell. Wait a minute, what am I grinding through? I didn't realize it. I was grinding through rotting flesh. <laughs> Never understood the significance of that, that that petrified dinosaur bone that I used to say would probably were millions of years old. Guess what? Maybe thousands, max? Okay, absolutely max. And most, maybe that dinosaur is perishing in a flood not too awful long ago. So I never understood that significance until now. Um, Schweitzer is the one who most recently had been working and actually showed that there was soft tissue in dinosaur bone. Okay? And um, she tried to get her data published. Now, she was an evolutionist, okay? She believed in evolution. But she tried to get it published, and she said, I had one reviewer tell me that he didn't care what I was finding or what the data said. He knew what I was finding wasn't possible. I wrote back and said, well, what data would convince you? He said, none. See, the problem is not with the data, it's the worldview, what we've been taught, what you screen out, what you accept and not, won't accept. So that's what's happening. Um, now they've found a lot of more soft tissue in a lot of different dinosaur bones as well. And I remember speaking at the University of Minnesota here uh, a few years back. We had one professor, at the, as soon as I said that, he said, oh, it's just biofilm. It's not soft tissue. So he shouted out, biofilm. Well, it turned out he was wrong. They've now substantiated 100% that this is soft tissue 
in dinosaur bone, okay? Actual soft tissue, that's a problem for evolution, all right? Now, even the person who discovered the soft tissue has been scrambling, trying to figure out how can she explain it in her evolutionary paradigm, the millions and millions of years. And she thought, well, maybe if we uh, soak this thing in concentrated hemoglobin, giving it plenty of iron, we might be able to preserve it longer. So she did an experiment, and sure enough, you could actually preserve some flesh for two years anyhow, two years, okay, in concentrated hemoglobin. Well, guess what? Two years is a far cry from 180 million years, okay? A lot of difference there. Uh, so that didn't happen. And where do you get concentrated hemoglobin? Except medical labs, right? You might get them there. Hmm. And also, in that particular um, thing, we find out that iron is not present with a lot of these fossils that are being found, that have the soft tissue. It's not there. And uh, they also had to keep these bones dry while they're petrifying. But what, what are they found in? River deposits or flood deposits. Okay, I would say no, no egg flood deposit. How are you going to keep it dry so that it could do that and get uh, preserved with that soft tissue? It just doesn't fit the model. So many things wrong with even those particular models that are being uh, suggested. They've now found over a hundred different fossils that have soft tissue in them, all the way from dinosaurs to way, way down supposedly 500 million year old fossils. Now, I'm throwing around these big numbers. I don't believe them, okay? But that's what they're saying these th fossils are. So how do you preserve these things for five, soft tissue for 500 million years? It just doesn't work. They found uh, skin that's still pliable, okay? Pliable skin. You can't get that for those millions of years. All right, so there's a good book that we have over there on our book table upstairs called Dinosaurs, Your Guide to Dinosaurs. It talks about the soft tissue. It's a wonderful book on dinosaurs as well. And we also have a little kid's book, just a little one like that, with solid meat in it. How many, how many times do you see kid's book is just fluff, kind of... No, this has good teaching. A little green book on dinosaurs. I really highly recommend that one. All right? Well, how do you know how old those dinosaurs are? This is one of my belt buckles. Okay? Uh, my dad was a silversmith, so we cut and polished the dinosaur bone. Hmm. Well, let's carbon date that. You see that black stuff in, those, uh, in that rock? Little black cell lines? You can date that because it has carbon in it. People would say, you know, you don't date dinosaur bone, it's too old. There's no way there's any preserved carbon-14 in there. And I said, well, hmm, maybe not. So there have been a group of scientists who have decided to date petrified dinosaur bone. The dates they got, thousands of years, not millions of years. Okay? And you can read about that from the Institute for Creation Research's uh, uh, project called their Rate Project about different things they found that are have carbon-14 in it that should not have it if they're millions and millions of years old. Does the Bible mention anything about dinosaurs? Actually, I think so. Job 40, it talks about behemoth. Behold now behemoth, which I made with you, with thee. He moves his tail like a cedar. He is the chief of the ways of God. He's big, he's powerful, okay? And behemoth, hmm. one of the largest animals we know. And some people say, well, maybe behemoth was, a, was an elephant. Well, look at that tail. Would you call that as a uh, cedar tree? Uh-uh. No, a hopalata hippopotamus. That tail is almost non-existent. <laughs> when we were speaking in Italy, we actually looked at the Italian translation. The word, they didn't use the word behemoth. 
they put, behold now, the hippopotamus. <laughs> no way. All right, they changed the word. Anyhow, no, I would consider that to be like a cedar tree, big, broad, cedar to Lebanon type of a tree. All right, I would say that. Well, we found the Gilgamesh epic about slaying a dragon. The description sounds like a dinosaur, by the way. And here's where I'm going with this, so you know. I believe people actually saw dinosaurs. The word dinosaur is a modern term. Back then, they used a term called dragon. Now, keep in mind that the classical definition of a dragon is a large reptile. Now, so let me ask with that definition, how many believe in dragons? I hope all hands go up because dragons, you know, we all saw large reptiles, right? Okay. Hmm. Well, could dragons breathe fire? We read something in the scripture about uh, Leviathan in Job 41, and it says something about, wow, his, on the bottom, his breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Boy, that guy had bad breath, probably. Right now, he actually could breathe fire. And you're going to find out there's a little tiny beetle, it's a half an inch long, that mixes two chemicals together. And when he does that and puts it in the explosion chamber, in the presence of oxygen, with, with that, with that valve, it produces a major blast right into the face of an approaching enemy. And he can shoot it with machine gun uh, consistency. All right? And so you think, wow, that's, if that little beetle can do it, what about these great big dinosaurs like that one right the big bonehead? What was that bone for? Was it just a horn? Well, was it something just to make noise? Well, it's actually connected to the back of the mouth. There's some recent scientific papers that are actually saying this was likely a chemical mixing chamber. If so, then it's very likely he could be uh, breathing fire into the face of an approaching enemy. It's a possibility. We don't know. You know why? We weren't there. We didn't see it. But we know the apparatus is capable of doing that. Okay? All right. Marco Polo visited China in 1271 AD. He reported the emperor raised dragons to pull his chariots in parades. So what do we know? They're big enough to pull a chariot, correct? They're large reptiles, dragons. Okay. All right. Hmm. St. George got his fame and known as the uh, dragon slayer. Dragon slayer. And every one of the artistic plates that show him slaying a dragon, they all look like dinosaurs from what we might recognize as a dinosaur in a museum today. They all look like the same body plan, okay? All right, but that gave him his fame. I've been uh, taking students down here in uh, Natural Bridges National Monument, and it's about a six-mile hike to get down through there, and uh, it's, but it's a fun hike. Along the way, you get lots of different uh, ancient American uh, uh, civilization type of uh, buildings and things they, where they lived. They had their worship centers in, and uh, that's a friend of mine there. But when you get down there, you find this particular bridge, and on that bridge happens to be what looks like a dinosaur. Wow picture we did lighten this up okay so you can see what it looks like but I believe that was a dinosaur I believe they actually could see that all right the Havasu Canyon in Arizona interesting they have a rock uh, formation a sandstone uh, thing that figure on the right is what they had drawn in there it's a dead ringer from the museum exhibit of a trachodon which is a type of dinosaur okay and then we've got Puff the Magic Dragon, uh, Wapatki National Park in Arizona. This is a creature that's actually belching fire, isn't it? All right. Hmm. And it has a basic body shape of some of the type of dinosaurs we see. 
There was the pterosaur drawing way back when in the Middle Ages. Again, there was a paleontologist that saw that drawing. And he said, based on that drawing, somebody must have seen the real thing because that's exactly what we would think a pterosaur would have looked like based upon the uh, anatomy and, that they have. Manitou Springs, Colorado, Indian prayer stick. Again, you see the hatchet head. All right, same as a, one of the pterosaurs, okay? All right, now, whoop, I want that one. Come back here. There. This is out of an Asian collection, and it looks like Ovaraptor. Ovaraptor. I mean, it's a dead ringer for what uh, Dr. Bacher had suggested Ovaraptor would look like. That's his drawing of it up there in the upper right. Again, it fits really nicely. This is the Amazon River Basin. The guys are hunting a creature that looks like a sauropod-type dinosaur. All right. Are these guys hunting a Crithosaurus, or is that Big Bird from Sesame Street? <laughs> it's big, right? But they're hunting it as well. We've got um, uh, sauropod-type dinosaurs on uh, ornamental uh, boxes uh, out of the uh, Far East. Um, here's a mosaic uh, called the Nile mosaic uh, crocodile. It's a le crocodile leopard, but we know that creature from the fossil record but thought it was extinct millions of years ago. But here it is, all right? They're hunting this thing. This is the floor in Israel. There's a mosaic there, and uh, I enjoyed seeing that when I was in Israel. And it's interesting because they're hunting another creature that if you take the ears off of it, it looks like a type of dinosaur that we have in the museums. Okay. This is a Mesopotamian cylinder seal. Uh, what are those creatures if they're not that type of dinosaur on your right? All right? Again, long-necked dinosaurs. Peruvian burial stones uh, have dinosaurs on them. They're about 1,000 years old. Some people said, oh, they're just fakes. Well, I agree. When people started going down there and asking if people would see them, if you contact me, I'll pay you good money for it, <laughs> all of a sudden they started manufacturing some of those uh, burial stones, and they were fakes. But I have a photographer friend who has basically photographed hundreds of those things. He says, I can always tell the original from a copy because of the coating on it. It's called a patina in, uh, in geology. Okay, so they have dinosaurs on them. This is the temple in Cambodia. Uh, they, what is that creature on that column? It looks like a stegosaurus, doesn't it? So what were the people in Cambodia a thousand years ago actually seeing? Perhaps it was a stegosaurus. Pottery, mosaics, etc. Again, depict dinosaurs, Mexican uh, uh, figurines that they find. Some of them have people fighting with them. The guy on the lower right isn't doing so well, <laughs> right? No. But people with these guys? Again, we're looking at potential of people having seen these things, having called them dinosaurs. The last example of it is Bishop Bell's tomb. And in fact, there's a brass engraving all the way around his uh, tomb. And it turns out uh, that it looks just exactly like that dinosaur, whoops, that dinosaur right there. Okay? So, hmm. Did people see these things? I believe because there's so many of them. The answer is yes. When did they draw these things? Well, all of these things that I've shown you, I've shown you here, has been post-flood. Post-flood. So did dinosaurs go on board that boat, the ark? Evidently. Because all this stuff is post-flood. Why were they so big? Some people suggest there was a water vapor canopy surrounding the earth. Others say there was a heightened magnetic field, but both of these sort of things could block out harmful radiation. And if you can block out harmful radiation coming in, like cosmic radiation, 
you can end up with longevity, okay? That's very important to understand. Either one of those models can work. And we see in the Bible that people live longer in the past. We have Methuselah, 960 years. By the way, Noah was 950, Adam was 930, correct? So people did live longer, except for that one guy there on the left that's way low. That was Enoch. He didn't die. God took him directly, okay? Anyhow, but the lifespan started going down, 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 until today. If you live to be 100, you're doing pretty good, okay? Doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, well, look at that. Dinosaurs have what's called, if they're reptiles, probably had indeterminate growth, like reptiles today. That means they keep growing as long as they live. You keep giving them plenty of food, they'll keep on growing. So rep, some reptiles today will outlive people. So if they could live as old as Methuselah, how big could they get? So that might explain how they got so large, okay? It wasn't just dinosaurs that were large, by the way. This is a, an ammonite, plenty of ammonites have been found. That's a fossil that probably a squid lived in. But some of them are as big as a tractor tire, up to nine feet in diameter. Those are big, okay? We find roaches in the fossil record that are plenty big can use them for footstools, right? And uh, uh, sea spiders that are, that's a quarter, that, that body is these, at least a foot long on that creature right there. All right, beavers were found seven feet long, camels 14 feet tall. It's a big camel, all right? So things were bigger in the past, weren't they? Okay, they really were. So what killed them? The ex different theories for the extinction of the dinosaurs, some killed by mammals, I agree. And by the way, in the fossil record, they used to think ma mammals came at close to the end of the dinosaur era. Now, in the geologic record, they have realized that we have mammals, 100% mammals, even right before some of the dinosaurs. That's a very odd thing, but sure enough, that's some of the latest reports going on there. Okay, uh, so um, maybe they were killed by mammals. Uh, oh, maybe the climate changed. Big thing, right? If there was a water vapor canopy that collapsed, giving you some of the water for the flood, not all of it, but some of it, then what were we going to see? The climate gra drastically changed when we no longer have that canopy model, right? So there was a big canopy uh, climate change then. What about a meteor strike? That's possible too. We expect that happened during the time of the flood. And, uh, but usually in a textbook, you might get the first three, but they never put the fourth one on there, flood. What if there was a big Noahic flood, right? That would have taken care of most of the dinosaurs, except for the dinosaurs that went on board that ark, okay? Some people say that dinosaurs aren't extinct. You can still find them. You can still find them. In fact, this guy, there's one guy that's done a research project uh, in the Congo, and he has found out that the native people down there have been talking about this big creature that lives in the swamps there in the Congo in a big specific lake area. He took an expedition in. He said he saw it. He said he saw the thing. He has recordings of what it sounded like at night. Nothing else we've ever matched. I'm not 100% buying into that yet, okay? I need a little more evidence. But, uh, um, so, but, um, when he went to talk to these uh, native people, they were actually trying to figure out what animal it was. They started showing him pictures of different types of animals, elephants, hippopotami, all these kind of things. No, 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 that's not it. They got to a picture of that type of dinosaur that you see right there, and they said, pointed to it, and they called it by name that they've been calling this thing. That's it, that's it, okay? They began dancing around that picture of them 
with their spears. Was maybe that's a real creature that's still around today. You know, do I believe there was a flood? Yeah. Sunday school tomorrow, I'm going to give you tremendous evidence from archaeology. I'm going to give you evidence from geology and the biblical record that that flood was valid. We have over 270 flood legends around the world that point to a common origin of that, and I think the origin will be the biblical ancient Hebraic uh, record. So if the dinosaurs went on the ark, was there a lot of pushing and shoving going on? Trying to get them in? Or, see, we got this little, this idea of the ark, this little tiny boat, correct? Animals pushing to get on, right? There's no way. Even a little child would say, there's no way that you can get those animals on board that boat, correct? And now they're inoculated for life. They hit a professor that says, we have so many species, there's no way that Noah's Ark could be a, a true. And then they're knocked out of the saddle in their belief, in their system, or their, uh, their faith. But the boat was big. We know that it was at least 300 cubits long, according to the biblical record. That means that boat would have been one and a half to two football fields in length. Is that a big boat? That's plenty of room for all the animals that had to go on board to fit on it. Okay? Plenty of room for that. And um, no pushing and shoving to get on it. But why take full-grown dinosaurs? And there aren't that many different types of dinosaurs that you need anyhow. There's a lot of variety, just like you see with big dogs, little dogs. They're all dog kind, aren't they? You don't have to take one of each. You don't have to take one of each of the horned dinosaurs uh, because they'll have their ability by dividing up the genetic pool to be able to produce so many of the different ones if you get the right combination. Okay, so anyhow, dinosaurs started in eggs, we think, and the biggest dinosaur egg that has ever been found is a little bigger than a football. Okay? So that means they were small. So why not take one that's young, has its full reproductive life ahead of it, if you're going to take any on the board, on board that boat? So, yeah. And because all those drawings and uh, figurines, etc., that I showed you were all post-flood, I believe those dinosaurs went on board that particular boat, okay? So what killed those dinosaurs? Here's Farside, Gary Larson, suggests the real reason dinosaurs became extinct, they took up smoking. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe they were hunted. Maybe that cartoon wasn't so absurd as I had claimed it was. You could probably feed the whole family on a dragon leg, couldn't you? And remember, St. George got his fame with dinosaurs, didn't he? He got his fame as known as a dragon slayer. When it became the in thing to kill a dragon, guess what? You're going to do it. The in thing. You want fame? Go kill a dragon. If you want to win the hand of the fair maiden in marriage, and you have to show your manhood by killing a dragon, these guys are going to do it. Okay, they'll do it. National Geographic and other journals says, oh, dinosaurs are not extinct. You'll look for them at your bird feeder. They said they just evolved into birds. And in fact, they'll show you a picture like this on the front cover of National Geographic. There's a feathery dinosaur. And in fact, Storrs Olson reacted to that, as did others. Storrs Olson is one of the top bird experts in the world from the Smithsonian Institute. He said, he accused the magazine of engaging in sensationalistic, unsubstantiated tabloid journalism. Clearly, he wrote, National Geographic is not receiving competent consultation in certain scientific matters. He is especially maddened or galled by the society's assertion that a wide variety of dinosaurs definitely wore feathers. Then he says, this is just a, well, a lie, he says. There is not one undisputed example of a dinosaur with feathers. None. The public deserves to know this. Hmm. 
Okay. Remember that nice picture on the front cover of uh, National Ge Geographic, etc.? It wasn't even uh, valid. It was a hoax. But let's continue here. Alan Fiducia, who is another evolutionist, but he also wants to deal fairly with the actual evidence. Okay? And uh, he says, when they put that feathered dinosaur on the cover last year, I threw 30 years worth of magazines out of my house. National Geographic's journalism is a joke. Then he talks about hair-like filaments that some people said, oh, those are proto-feathers, or thinking it's on its way to becoming a feather. Okay, that's what that means. He said, the hair-like filaments that accompany some fossils come from beneath the skin. I can duplicate the effect by skinning the tail of a modern lizard. I have to tell the university's students not to do that in their dorm room, okay? <laughs> but uh, anyhow, he was really teched with that. Remember that picture that showed up in National Geographic? It turned out to be a hoax. Somebody put five different fossils together there from China, sold it to a museum, and probably for a good price, okay? He was making a good living doing that kind of thing. And uh, then articles came out saying it was a forgery. Multiple things put together, and they were finally, they were able to prove that, actually, okay? Pretty soon, another one of them fell out of the sky. And here's another one. It says, uh, last April, according, uh, that was back in 2000, Nature published a paper by Kevin Padian, the University of California, Berkeley, on a pterosaur with a tail from the same fossil deposit where Archaeoraptor was found. That was the first one that came out to be a hoax, okay? Zoo says the tail was added by a local resident before selling it to a Chinese museum. Okay, so we've got several of these now that they thought was a half bird, half dinosaur out of the picture. National Geographic uh, put this particular picture in showing the path to birds and how a leg got more and more feathery until this creature took off and flew away. It sounds really good. They have names for these different fossils. But interesting, some of those fossils that they mention are actually true birds. And they didn't mention others that probably should have been in that lineup, but they didn't put those in. And all of that nice, feathery-looking leg, guess what that is? It turns out, artwork. It's artwork. It's imagination. It is not what they found. Well, my artist at Alpha Omega Institute um, actually took this apart and put that together. He's done a lot of study on these dinosaurs supposed turning into birds, he took that apart and put it in the real order of where it's found. And sure enough, you find birds where they're supposed to be. But wait, 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 wait. Look at that. Before some of the dinosaurs, you already have birds. You can't be your own grandmother. So this is a problem here, right? This is a big problem. And uh, so, it's in the wrong order. Okay. And some of them all the way through were true birds. So what does Kevin Padian say about that? Remember, he's pushing this dinosaur to bird evolution? He said, no, no problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> no problem, says Kevin, Kevin Padian uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. He said, we don't always get everything in the fossil record in perfect order. Guess what? It is a problem. Now, it's very important to understand that most all of those creatures, they say were half birds, half dinosaurs, these had feathers, correct? It's important to understand that these are all of the kids' textbooks now. Even though they've been shown to be forgeries or true birds or whatever. Our kids need to know that. Our grandkids know, need to know that as well, okay? Anyhow, we can talk about a bunch of those things. But here's one that I love, this article here. It said, the fossil provides strong evidence that dinosaurs had a breathing mechanism similar to that of modern crocodiles and completely different from that of birds. 
And that's one of the big issue with dinosaurs evolving into birds is the type of lung system that they have. Okay? Very different. And there's no way you're going to go from one to the other. Can you imagine what a half bird, half dinosaur ought to look like? You know, you've got to keep the teeth and whatever. And wouldn't that be a great one to be meeting when you're walking on a hiking trail? Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, that's artwork. That's artwork. <laughs> Photoshop. <laughs> okay. Well, when we look at dinosaurs, we find out the struggle is over the interpretation of the data, not the actual data. And sometimes that data, uh, uh, the uh, interpretation is subject to us wanting so badly to prove that dinosaurs evolved from birds that we make big mistakes and accept fossils that should not be accepted, period. And that has been done very, very regularly. Well, I believe that the idea that the flood killed most of the dinosaurs, and there was a genuine flood tomorrow morning, Sunday school class, Mary Jo said that's, uh, she likes that the best of all of my lectures, okay? It's good stuff. I'm, real, I'm a geologist and I love to show some of that stuff. But I find out that there was destruction in the past. There was a flood. And, hmm, God gives us warning and a means of escape, like he gave the ark last time. He's given us plenty of warning that there's another destruction coming, correct? And, but we have a way of escaping that, and that is through accepting the work of Jesus Christ done on the cross, okay, where he shed his blood. And so we need to look at that. If you don't know about that, come talk to me. It's very important. Because as I see what's going on today, I'm wondering, when is God going to say, enough is enough? When? wonder about it, right? And so, uh, very important. Even in the area of dinosaurs, stand firmly on God's Word, okay? So, we're going to be talking more right after dinner. We have potluck coming up, and then uh, right after potluck, we're going to be talking about the fossil record, and then about the, um, um, we'll be talking as well about, um, uh, the, was Darwin wrong about some of the things he thought was true about biology? And was Darwin wrong? What's being presented today about modern evolution? Okay? And we're going to show that uh, Darwin was wrong, we think. But then again, he didn't know very much about uh, modern cellular biology, microbiology, etc. All right. So our website, I, we mentioned something about our tours. Costa Rica Creation Tour coming up. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I thought I changed that slide. Okay, creation tour, this was an old slide, and I said, what in the world is that doing there? <laughs> All right, anyhow, March 7 through 16, coming up this, this uh, March. Uh, Yellowstone tour, August 26 through August uh, 30, and then also September 2 through uh, 6. Two different back-to-back -back tours of those uh, places. Yellowstone creation tour, Costa Rican, amazing evidence for design and creation in Costa Rica, okay? And so, uh, anyhow, so discover creation, <clears throat> worship the creator, even when we talk about dinosaurs. <laughs>